Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Jemanski. I'm the educator for agricultural and natural resources in Perry County, Indiana. And I'd like to welcome you to our monthly small ruminant webinar. Today we have a special guest, Dr. Michael Neary. He is our Purdue Extension sheep and goat specialist, and he is located on campus. And today he's going to talk to us about breeding management of sheep and goats. So with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Neary. Okay, Sarah, thank you very much. And like Sarah said, welcome to everybody. Um, gonna, gonna try to keep this talk, hopefully within a, uh, although it is a very important topic and it is a very timely topic. Um, and I understand that various people breeding season is different. I mean, some people don't breed, some people breed for say April and May kids or lambs. Some people breed for December, January and anything in between. So it's difficult to, you know, it's difficult to pick a, a good time for a topic like this. But even if you don't breed till say October or November, um, I still think it's a timely topic um, because, you know, there's a lot of preparations that need to need to take place. And we're not talking about rocket science here when we're talking about breeding management of sheep and goats. Uh, um, there's a few simple things that if they're done timely and applied in a, in a proactive manner, um, they're proven techniques that hopefully can re, uh, increase your reproductive efficiency of your operation. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, some of these simple management techniques um, what we're trying to do is increase productivity or reproductive efficiency. And then hopefully some of the things we do hopefully can uh, reduce our labor needs and our management inputs uh, during the lambing and kidding season. And what we'll do is we'll concentrate today on uh, the U and the doe management or the female management. Uh, and then we're going to also talk about ram and buck management, a very important topic. And then I do want to talk about um, near the end a little bit on some some management strategies in terms of breeding ewe lambs or breeding dolings uh, so that they lamb or kid at say 12 to 14 months of age. All right, first, we we'll talk about reproductive efficiency, and that is simply um, really what this is described as is the number of lambs or kids weaned per female exposed. And it's the almost always one of the two biggest variabilities in profitability of an enterprise, that and feed costs. If I know the reproductive efficiency of your operation and I know the feed costs, I can pretty well accurately guess if your operation is, is at least break even or if it's profitable. That's how big of an issue reproductive efficiency is. And it's a really big variable in prof and profitability. And like I mentioned, we generally refer to it as, you know, pounds of weaned per you or doe exposed. And of course, so the two biggest variables to go into that, number one is did they get pregnant? Okay, if you have a high number of animals that are open or not pregnant, uh, come lambing or kidding time, that really adversely affects reproductive efficiency. And then, of course, the big one is prolificacy or, or your twinning rate, basically. Um, and this reproductive efficiency, of course, is um, influenced by genetics. And there are a lot of genetic differences in reproductive efficiency, pretty well proven. Uh, certainly, uh, the nutrition program has a, a big effect on reproductive efficiency, um, especially if those animals are genetically capable of producing at a high level. And then health issues, and there's a number of health issues that can affect reproductive efficiency. So if there's a weak link in any of these areas, generally the first thing that suffers is reproductive efficiency. So, and oftentimes it's hard to determine that you maybe, maybe you should have got 170% lambing or kidding um, rate, but you get 150%, and it's hard to quantify that because there's really no way to measure it, um, but yet, um, it is kind of that hidden loss. Okay. Um, sheep and goats are generally considered to be seasonally polyesterous. Now, I understand 
that there are certain breeds and there's very and certainly individuals within breeds or breed crosses that are not seasonally polyesterous or that will breed out of season for say fall lambs or fall kids but in general sheep and goats are considered seasonally poly, uh, seasonally polyesterous which simply means they will have multiple heat cycles within a season or seasons okay that also means they have what's referred to as an, an, an estrus period a-N-E-S-T-R-O-U-S, which means they're not cycling at all. Uh, and these are uh, factored by the light to dark ratio. So like now, you notice, uh, especially in the morning, I noticed it in the morning, it's not getting as light as, as early as it was. You know, you know, a few weeks ago, it was, you could pretty well see at 5.30 in the morning, and now it's, it's creeping out where it's a little bit later in the morning where the sun's out. So it's a light to dark ratio effect, and basically sheep and goats in general are considered are referred to as short day breeders. So as the days get shorter, that's when they start to cycle. That's when they start to come into estrus. Now, like I mentioned, the breed can certainly affect this. The breed can affect it in terms of some breeds known to cycle and, and, and breed pretty well out of season, but it also the breed can affect it that some animals will start cycling, say in a week or two, um, as the days are starting to get shorter, but some breeds and breed types may not start cycling, you know, maybe for four to six weeks. So there is a breed effect on that. And there's also a latitude effect on that. So the closer one is to the equator, the less pronounced the daylight to dark ratio is, therefore um, the less pronounced the anestrous period is in sheep or goats. So like if you lived in Texas, you're certainly closer to the equator than if you lived in central Minnesota, uh, and if you lived in Texas, uh, your animals are more likely to, to cycle out of season. It's just a latitude effect and a daylight effect. Uh, we use this to, I use this, I like to use this to uh, kind of determine when optimum fertility is. And generally optimum fertility, and that concludes fertility and very oftentimes uh, prolificacy or the number of, or, or the rate of ovulation when the daylight is about 10 to 12 hours, okay? Depending on their latitude, um, you know, it depends on when, what month that is. And here in Indiana and in the upper Midwest, uh, that's generally in October and November. Okay, I'm not going to bore you too long with this, but I'll give you a quick little rundown of, of the anestrus and estrus cycle. Um, as, as we uh, are in the anestrus or the non-breeding phase of the, of the calendar year, uh, the dominant hormone just like it is for pregnancy, uh, and is produced by what's called the corpus luteum, which is generally referred to as a CL. The progesterone is present in high levels, and it basically prevents that you or uh, doe from cycling, from having an estrus cycle, okay? As the days start getting shorter, and they're starting to get shorter now, hopefully, you know, in the next few weeks, they're gonna start to get cooler, the nights are, um, that has an effect on the, um, uh, the, pituitary, uh, the pituitary gland via the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then secretes what's called GnRH, gonadotropin-releasing hormone. It affects the pituitary. I'm not going to tell you all the stuff. You can review it later if you need to. But it, um, the end result is there's a feedback loop by melatonin and other hormones, which acts upon the anterior pituitary, which then acts upon the ovaries and the uterus. And the significance of this is the uterus then, especially in the U, uh, produces a prostaglandin called PGF2-alpha. And some of you might be familiar with lutelase. That's, that's basically what that is. Um, and what PGF2-alpha does is it causes the CL, which produces the progesterone, to start to go away, to start to regress. And then you end up with reduced progesterone and you get kind of a cyclical effect here. But the end result is uh, you get progesterone in a low enough level that the anterior pituitary is then fed back on upon and it starts to secrete FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, and LH, which is luteinizing hormone. Um, and then you start to see that animal exhibit estrus, uh, to go into estrus cycle, and then actually exhibit standing heat or estrus. An estrogen has an effect upon that, and it has an effect upon a number of the behavioral things you see, like in goats, the tail wagging and the, the nervousness and the vocal. And use it's a little less pronounced, but 
you know, certainly seeking out the male is one. And then you get ovulation, and that's kind of the, the quick overview. So what we want to try to do is affect that ovulation, um, and what we want to try to do with that ovulation is we want to increase that ovulation, the rate of eggs produced, um, so that we have a higher chance of a, of a higher twinning percent. Most people like that. Most people don't like triplets, but they do like twins. So, okay, the estrus or the standing heat itself lasts from about 24 to 48, 48 hours. And there's a, you know, some variability in there. Uh, for those females that are, uh, have multiple ovulations, it tends to be a little bit longer. Uh, for those younger females, especially for first timers like you, you lambs or doelings, it tends to be a little shorter than that. Now, if she's not fertilized, then uh, in the ewe, she'll come back into heat, you know, standing heat 16 to 17 days later. And of course, in the doe, it'll be 20 to 21 days later. So that's kind of a quick overview of that. So we spend a lot of time trying to increase our ovulation rate, a lot of time and effort trying to figure out ways to increase ovulation rate, you know, things like crossbreeding with prolific breeds and just crossbreeding in general, uh, management techniques, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just a few things about it is the ovulation does tend to be higher in late September, October, and November than, say, in July and August when those females are just coming into the estrus cycle. And I guess the same could be true for if they haven't been bred, even into January, their, their, uh, their, their ovulation would start to decrease because they're starting to enter the an estrus period. Just, I got to take a drink, sorry. And as I mentioned before, <clears throat> this is affected by breed dependent, uh, you know, breed effects and then the latitude. All right, one thing I do want you to remember ab about this slide is that um, those ewes and does, as they're coming out of the anestrus season, which is soon, uh, and that very first heat after the anestrus season, very often have a lower ovulation rate than they would at subsequent um, um, uh, heat cycles. So that very first, um, that very first estrus, that very first heat, is generally not as productive in terms of twinning percentage, and often also also fertility as well. So if you can get them bred on the second or third heat cycle after an estrus, you're generally going to have a higher fertility rate. Uh, you're going to have a, which means you're going to have a reduced number of days in your lambing or kidding season, and you're also going to have a higher twinning percentage. Uh, we oftentimes use a teaser ram or buck try to take advantage of this, to try to uh, get ewes and does into heat a little bit earlier. And then we put a fertile ram, uh, fertile ram or buck in later. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. <clears throat> All right, let's talk a little bit about breeding season management itself. Um, and timing and timeliness is, like I said, this isn't rocket science. You pay attention to some details and have some proven management techniques. You're probably going to have a more optimum reproductive efficiency. But the timing of stuff is very important because if there's problems, then you've got a little time to, uh, to fix them. So about six weeks before breeding, and it probably should have put six to eight weeks before breeding season, uh, it's a good time, you know, to get the, the user does in, give them a good evaluation, you know, check over their health, check over their soundness, Palpate their udders. If you've got some with, with bad udders, that would be the time to call them. Um, you know, make sure their feet are in good shape. Uh, make sure you check them, you know, FAMACHA score them or fecal egg count them and kind of get an indication of the parasite status of the, of the, of the herd. Uh, so you can decide if you need to treat or not for parasites. Uh, and a big one is body condition score them. Uh, determine what their body condition score is. So if they're a little on the thin side, um, you've got some time at six to eight weeks to up their nutrition and get them in a more optimal body condition score um, before joining with the ram or the buck. Um, and just keep in mind, it takes about eight to 10% of their body weight to move one body condition score. So if they're, if they're a two and you lie on them to be a three body condition score, you know, it's going to take a little while to get them up there. So you want to know that well in advance so you've got time to uh, to evaluate that. And then the vaccination program, if needed, and I'll talk about that here in a second, which this slide is not in the notes. I added that this morning because I basically forgot about it. Sorry. 
Um, but I do want to say a couple of words about a vaccination for abortive diseases. Now, I can't tell, I can't make a general recommendation if, if an operation should or should not vaccinate for the abortive diseases. And the main ones we're talking about here is the campylobacteriosis or commonly called vibriosis or, you know, enzootic abortion or EAA, which is commonly referred to as chlamydia. <clears throat> Some operations is probably in their best interest to vaccinate. Some operations may not need to vaccinate. It just depends. Um, I would encourage you to work with your veterinarian to determine whether you should or should not vaccinate. If you've got a closed flock, you don't bring any um, any new females onto the place, maybe just bring a ram or buck in occasionally, uh, and have never had trouble with these abortive diseases, um, you probably don't need to vaccinate for them. Now, if you don't have a fairly closed operation, and you co-mingle animals from other operations, whether purchase, lease, sharing of males, going to the fair, going to sales, things like that, then you probably should vaccinate for these two um, um, reproductive disorders. And you know, when they hit, it's it's a can be a disaster. So um, if it's if it's vibriosis, basically you give a vaccine before. You introduce the male, so at that six to eight week period, you could, as you're evaluating those females, uh, you can give them their first vaccine, a Campylobacter, uh, and then you give a, a booster in their last trimester of the pregnancy. If it's chlamydia, um, generally it's recommended that they're that they're given their initial, if they've never been vaccinated before, um, they're given their initial vaccine six weeks before joining with the male. A booster shot two weeks later before joining with the male, and then once they've had that series, they just need one annual booster in that you know that last two to six weeks uh, before putting the ram or the buck in. Again, work with your veterinarian, devise a strategy of number one: Do I need to vaccinate? And number two: uh, What should my program be? I want to go back to body condition score quickly. Um, this is a body condition score uh, three doe. I mean, looks great. I mean, she's ready to breed. You know, she's filled out. You know, you can see down here in the fore flank, rear flank. You can see how smooth she is up top. Got some, got some uh, fullness in that rump area. Uh, you know, she's in healthy. Look, appears to be healthy. Certainly in a good body condition score. Uh, doesn't need a whole lot. Uh, however, if you had her in a group and maybe ten like her. But then there was, say, six or seven that were a good bit thinner than her, then you're going to need to have a strategy to get them into the body condition score that she is in. So that may be separation and feeding, you know, whatever the, the strategy might be. But you're wanting these animals, these females, to go into, into the breeding season at, at about a 3 to a 3.5 body condition score, which is pretty much optimum. Okay, so feeding not difficult to do preparing for breeding season not difficult at all but the timing of it uh and the level of it uh and it's a lot based on their body condition score somewhat on their age uh, is very important so we have goals um as we're feeding animal these females before breeding certainly we want to increase the number of twins the number born very important that we increase the number of bred Typically, in a normal operation, you're going to have three, four, five percent of those user does that simply don't breed for whatever reason. Uh, maybe they breed and reabsorb. Maybe they never cycle. Maybe they've got cyst, cystosis, cyst, cystic over. You know, who knows why? Uh, so that's a normal level. But we don't want ten or twelve percent because that's a real reproductive wastage. So we want to increase the number they get bred. And I would say it would certainly be nice if we can get them all bred within two heat cycles which really simplifies in our, our lambing and kidding season because it prevents a lot of burnout. Uh, the most effective way, a, a time-proven old method that works is what's referred to as flushing. And I'm not talking about embryo flushing, but, but flushing, which basically is increasing body weight. That's what it means. You, you're wanting to increase the body weight of those females before turning the ram or buck in. And that has been proven over and over through the years 
to increase reproductive performance in terms of number, you know, the twinning percentage as well as the the uh, the number that are bred and the number that are bred on their first or second cycle. Uh, flushing is effective. Some people would say it's not effective in, in, in heavier animals. That's not true. It's just not as effective. It's most effective in those animals that are thinner as you're starting to come in, you know, that four to six, eight, eight weeks before breeding. If they're a little on the thin side and you can flush them up and increase their body condition and their body weight, it seems to be more effective in those. Flushing is simply increasing the energy content to the use of the dose. And you can do that a number of methods. If you've got really good pasture, um, you, can, you can utilize that. Uh, it might take a little longer than it would if you're feeding grain, or you can simply feed some high energy feedstuffs, generally some type of grain. Okay, we're just trying to increase their body weight. Uh, however we do that, there's not a right or wrong way. But probably the easiest way is to feed them some grain and you kind of know they're getting it. Uh, one thing about mineral nutrition, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but very, very important as you enter the breeding season. And I don't mean just the day you turn the ram or buck in, but as you're coming into the breeding season, say at least six to eight weeks before, make sure, make sure your mineral pro, uh, program is sound. And those animals have access to minerals, trace minerals, especially selenium. And if you're breeding on pasture, vitamin E is not as big a deal because green grass, as long as it's green, has a pretty high level of vitamin E. But if you're breeding, say, in dry lot with some older hay or something, along with some grain, uh, you want, might want to pay a, a pretty close attention to uh, vitamin E as well. And I'm not saying the other minerals aren't as important, but those two are really, really crucial. Okay, so how do we increase ovulation rate? Um, basically, we increase ovulation rate, so we increase twinning percent. So if we can increase the ovulation rate and simultaneously we can decrease the embryonic loss, which there's a level that's kind of normal, but we don't want to, you know, get above that normal level, uh, you're going to have more lambs and kids born per female exposed. Okay, already mentioned uh, the season at breeding. Okay, so if you're breeding at a, a very, very ideal time in terms of the light dark ratio, generally going to tend to have our a higher ovulation rate. Um, it's a pretty well-known fact that spring breeding for say like fall lambs or fall kids, uh, and there are individuals that'll do that. And I'm assuming natural breeding, not, not hormone manipulated breeding, but natural breeding. Uh, generally, they're gonna have about a 20% lower twinning percentage. Um, that's pretty well commonly known. And it just has to do with season and daylight and dark ratio, okay? All right, so in terms of feeding, our kind of our ultimate goal is a body condition score of a three up to a 3.5. Don't really like that four. They start getting too fat. Sometimes they won't settle as easily that way, uh, but that three to three five is really pretty optim optimum. Generally, the breeding season coincides with uh, pasture grazing, okay? And if you need to, depending on how thin those animals are, and the quality of the forage available to them, um, that's when you can supplement with high energy feedstuffs. Uh, basically in Indiana here, we're talking about corn. Okay, it's cheap, readily available, doesn't have to be fancy. You can feed whole shelled corn. Doesn't have to be cracked. It uh, doesn't have to be mixed up with anything unless you wanna include some sort of mineral mix. Um, and it's pretty simple, but it's a matter of doing it and doing it at the right weight. Usually these animals need to be fed about two to two and a half percent of their total dry for of total dry matter intake for a flushing effect. And that includes where they're, what they're grazing. So what they're grazing and, or if they're eating on hay, uh, plus their grain mix should be about two to two and a half percent of their body weight on a dry basis. And that level is a little different depending on how thin they are or how ideal they are. So you wanna keep them on a flushing diet, which is simply usually, you know, a half, to a pound of corn per day per, per female uh, in good quality pasture, you know, about two to four weeks before ram and, and buck introduction. And, and when that is depends on their, their body score. That's why we like to look at them six to eight weeks before and decide. And then you wanna keep them on this diet and not change it radically for at least another two to four weeks after uh, joining of the, of the male. I already mentioned that, usually a half to a pound, a pound of corn or equivalent. Uh, and then I mentioned it before, I'll mention it again, a, a good quality mineral mix 
well before breeding season uh, with adequate selenium, very, very, very important. And, and I already mentioned about vitamin E as well, if they're not on a on green, uh, green pasture. Okay, once breeding is in, in concluded, I said in the last slide that the one of those slides that, you know, the the number of lambs or kids weaned per exposed depends on ovulation rate and then also depends on embryonic losses. So once we finish breeding, uh, management's still important for a while, okay? The reason is, is that as the, as the eggs are fertilized by the sperm, they go through a division, the fertilized, uh, and then they go through a division and they, they, they go into the uterus. And they're just free floating in the uterus for at least 17 to 20 days. I usually figure 25 to 30 just to be safe. Uh, and they do that embryo does not implant into the uterine, uterine wall until this time period. The significance of that is, is they're very, the, the embryos are very at risk of, of embryonic loss uh, during this free floating stage. And very at risk. So if you're going to have a high reproductive mortality, very often, especially with sheep and still with goats as well, but especially with sheep, uh, most of your embryonic mortality is going to happen before uterine implantation. And it can reach 20 to 30 percent, which is a lot. I mean, if you could have a 20 percent higher kid or lamb crop, um, that that's pretty noticeable. So the main thing we can and like I said, some of this is normal but you just don't want it at an abnormal high level. So the things we try to do to decrease embryonic mortality is try to reduce the stress on these females. So that's one reason why you try to leave them on that flushing diet for two to three weeks after uh, putting the ram in. <clears throat> also trying to eliminate or keep to a, as low and of a practical level of other sources of stress, things like uh, health challenges, uh, you know, pneumonia, foot rot, um, you know, other heavily parasitized, um, these things certainly are not good for embryonic survival. A big one will be transport. You know, try not to haul your sheep or goats uh, in that first three to four weeks after the breeding season because that's a stress on them and you're probably going to have a little lower kidding or lambing rate because you're going to increase your embryonic mortality. A big one, and it's hard to do anything about it, is simply hot weather. So if you can provide shade, good clean water, uh, try not to, to move those animals as little as practical uh, to help keep them cool. That should help your embryonic survival. And then a big one's co-mingling females. Say you're done breeding, you got two or three groups and you put them all together. Well, there's going to be some fighting, some social dominance effects. Uh, that's certainly not good. And then, of course, handling and working and running these animals through you know, the working facilities, you know, things like that. All those things are stressors to their system. And if those embryos are free floating in the uterus and not implanted yet, um, they're certainly at an increased risk, risk for an increased level of embryonic mortality. All right, so I just wanna say a couple words about early gestation. And that's, you may ask why this has an effect on the breeding season, because it affects, um, it affects a number of things. One, embryonic mortality. But in early gestation and mid gestation, there's not much fetal growth, okay? Let's say the embryos have implanted into the uterus, uh, into the placenta, it's growing. So the biggest thing in early gestation and mid gestation is not fetal growth, but placental growth. And why that is important is because that's the source of nutrients and the exchange of waste products from, uh, the, from the feti and their mother. And if that placental growth is not adequate, you're gonna end up with smaller lambs, smaller kids, ones that you know, are at an increased risk of mortality. They're gonna to need to be tube fed, they're gonna need bottle fed, they're, they just don't have the vigor and the get up and go. And that certainly affects uh, your labor needs and also your, your survival. So, and if you're a sheep person, that's when the wool follicles are put down by the, by the lamb. Um, so if you're strikingly underfeeding after breeding, and I'm talking, you know, the, that first 30 to 80 days, uh, you're going to get decreased placental growth and potentially lower birth weight lambs and kids. Now we're not talking about a fancy feed program here. They have low needs still, um, but what you're trying to do 
is to not shock their system by a real change in their nutrition program and especially a change that, that includes a, a, a real decrease in energy needs, okay? So they have low needs. You want them to be about two and a half to three, maybe a little higher in body condition score. Similar dry matter intake, you know, a little bit higher than maintenance. Uh, that TDN of 52 to 54 can be met by forage alone. Protein needs are, are, are uh, minimal. So what you want to do, like I mentioned, is avoid sharp weight loss. Okay, you don't want them to go from a, you know, a three and a half body condition score to a two and a half body condition score. So that means they've lost 10% of their body weight. Uh, and that's going to affect their placental growth, which then is going to affect your needs in lambing or kidding uh, in terms of management inputs. So if they're fat, if they're in good shape, if they're older and mature, they can actually lose a little bit of weight but you don't want it to be in a week's time period. So if they're over conditioned, they can lose about a half a body condition score, which may be from four to eight pounds, depending on their, their, um, their mature weight. However, if they're young animals and or thin of any age, say, you know, elderly animals, uh, and they've got some thinness to them, you don't want them to lose this half a body condition score. You want them to at least maintain and possibly young ones, you're gonna want them to grow. So. The big take point, take home point is they could lose a little bit of weight, but you don't want them to lose a noticeably sharp level because that's going to affect things. Uh, forage still, if you've got fall grazing, adequate, very adequate if it's decent, if it's decent grazing. Um, you know, if you're grazing crop residues, uh, which some producers still do, um, you know, especially corn fields, you're going to have to supplement some protein because those corn residues don't have enough protein in them. So you'll have to give some protein, not necessarily every day, but say three or four times a week. And that might be simply something as simple as some decent alfalfa hay, or it could be a little bit of pellets, whatever you can get a little bit of protein into them. And then of course, calcium. And again, their mineral program, you don't want to stress them with an inadequate mineral program. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to change gears here. We're going to talk about the ram and buck. And I have been the sheep and sheep specialist for 31 years and picked up goats about 10 or 12 years ago, maybe 15. And I will tell you right now, and most a lot of you listening will know it's true, is sheep and goat producers are not as uh, conscientious about making sure the ram and buck has been treated right before the breeding season, especially as it comes to a breeding soundness exam. Uh, and it's cheap insurance, I'll tell you that. And the thing about it that makes it really important is that most of these smaller operations uh, only have one or two, you know, males that are, they consider, you know, fit to breed in terms of uh, genetic, genetic quality. So if you have a problem, then it can be a potential catastrophe. Because um, you know the, the user does aren't going to get pregnant with a with a ram or buck that's that's not fertile for whatever reason. Okay, so it can be a real weak weak link in the breeding season. I guarantee I hear this every year where people have had a big problem getting their using or dose uh, settled, and that and it's you know magnified at lambing time, and they have a lot a lot of open open females. Okay, and the reason this is important is because. It's been pretty well documented that up to 10 to 15% of rams or bucks have some issue that may have adversely affect their ability to breed and ability to get those females uh, pregnant. And that's a pretty high number. All right, rams and bucks are light sensitive, but not near as light sensitive as, as uh, the ewe or the doe is. Um, so they don't really have an anestrous period, okay? But, so and many of them are still fertile year round, uh, but they may not be as optimum for, have as optimum fertility. So for instance, if you did scrotal circumference measuring all year round on a group of rams or bucks, you would find during that anestrous period that their circumference is normally um, lower or less. And oftentimes they'll carry their testicles a little closer up to their body cavity. They may still be able to breed, but they're not really you know, in peak condition yet, okay? Uh, their semen quality, their libido um, starts to become, you know, some people refer to it as the rut. It becomes, you know, more pronounced during those, 
you know, same periods that the user does are, are starting to cycle as the days get a little shorter. One thing about rams is they're very sensitive to environmental temperature. Really, that, that, that statement's a little bit wrong. They're very sensitive to their, the body temperature, their body temperature in terms of their fertility, which is often affected by environmental temperature, but it can also be affected by anything that, say, would cause a fever, for instance, or a, an increase in body temperature. Maybe it's forced exercise. Maybe it's pneumonia. Maybe it's a spike in their fever. Maybe it's really hot days. They have, don't have shade and with an airflow. Um, and, and they can go, they can get what's referred to as a temporary infertility, which will last four to eight weeks. Um, and they're basically, um, you know, they're not fertile, even though they may be breeding ewes. Oftentimes, once they're, they're once that six to eight, four to eight weeks is over, they may come back into fertility. Uh, but, you know, it's a long time in the, in the breeding season. Eight weeks is a long time. So if you've got one that's been heated, it can be a disaster. All right, I want to talk about a breeding soundness exam. I referred to it earlier. Um, and for 50 bucks or so, uh, it's cheap insurance. I don't know what your local vet would charge, but probably 50 to $100. Cheap insurance. Um, and it's be I've got four to six weeks here on this turn before turnout. Probably be better six to eight weeks, really, but at least four weeks and six to eight would be better uh, to do a breeding soundness exam. And a breeding soundness exam is just an overall evaluation of the male for um, his readiness to breed. Now, one thing about a breeding soundness exam, it's not a guarantee that they're going to breed, and they're not. It's not a guarantee that they're going to settle user does. But what the goal of a breeding soundness exam is, is to identify those individuals that have some problem that may prevent them from getting, and we can figure that out and then we can identify them before the breeding season. So it's not 100% guarantee, but it goes a long ways towards identifying those with a problem. So there's basically three parts to a breeding soundness exam, just a simple physical exam. Uh, secondly, an inspection of their reproductive organs and an evaluation of them. And then the third thing would be actual semen collection and evaluation. We'll go through each of those real quickly. Uh, physics, physical exam, body condition score, uh, important. They are going to lose weight during the breeding season. I don't care how much you're, you're feeding them unless they're just breeding three or four head, okay? If they're out in the pasture and they're moving around and they're breeding user does, and they're the right kind of male with a lot of, uh, with a lot of get up and go and a lot of li libido, uh, they're going to lose some weight. So very often we want them about a 3.5 body condition score. So they've got some weight they can lose and still still get the job done. Uh, the problem with them being too fat is, is it kind of decreases libido, increases, decreases fitness, uh, makes them lazy, uh, and you don't want them over conditioned, but you certainly don't want them under conditioned either. Another part of the physical exam is just overall structure and soundness evaluation. Uh, you know, what's their conformation? You know, do they have a swelled hock? Do they have swelled knees? Are their feet sound? Uh, there's no presence of limping, no foot rot. You know, is their hind legs sound uh, where they can support their weight as they're breeding? Uh, you know, check their lameness status. Simple things like looking at their teeth, making sure there's not a problem making sure their eyes are good, not cloudy, you know, but two good working eyes. Uh, and then of course, oftentimes you, you trim their hooves a little bit, make sure their hooves are in good shape, and then evaluate their parasite status so you can decide if they need treated or not. <coughs> Excuse me. The second part of the breeding sinus exam is simply evaluation of the reproductive organs. And that includes palpation of the scrotum. Um, just palpate it, examine it, Make sure there's no injuries to the scrotum, like frostbite, any disease issues, anything that might affect their fertility. Uh, along with this, you'd palpate the testes. Uh, you're looking for a, a reasonably symmetry of size. And now, oftentimes, they're not exactly the same size, but you don't want a very large one and a very small one or something like that. Uh, you want to palpate the testes to make sure the tissue is, is consistent in, in type. It's not too hard. It's not too soft. You know, um, it's just right, so to speak. Uh, you also palpate the size of the epididymis, uh, which if they're enlarged or if they're scarred, 
It could in indicate Brucella ovus, which is a disease that can affect rams, especially a uh, pretty serious disease. It's more of, a, uh, more of a problem out west than it is in the Midwest, but as we see animals move from, you know, coast to coast, it can be an issue anywhere. Um, generally, most producers won't do this, but the, a veterinarian will, or a reproductive specialist, they can examine the pe penis by exteriorizing or, or, or extending it out of the, out of the, uh, of the sheath. Um, what they'd be looking for there is any injuries, any scarring, any lesions, uh, any warts, any any hair or wool rings, things like that. Uh, then you can also check for pizzle rot, which is a fairly common condition in rams, um, which basically affects the very end of the sheath and it makes it painful. And it's it's uh, anyway you can look that up. We don't have time for that. And then they'll take the scrotal circumference, measure the scrotal circumference. So scrotal circumference measurement, you can see from this photo, is simply a flexible tape. It's taken in centimeters. Um, you, you put it, you can have the ram or the buck either standing up or you can put them on the rump, whichever is easier. But you simply extend the scrotum out to its natural shape and then you take that measurement at the widest point of the scrotum. And you don't want to push in too hard. You don't want to have too much slack. You want it to be nice and snug and at the widest point of the of the uh, of the scrotal tissue, and then you simply record that number. And this is for rams. I just don't. There's not really a lot of information about goats or bucks on minimum scrotal circumference. Uh, but for rams, um, you know, depending on their age, and I will say there's also a breed effect here too. But generally, say you're breeding. So let's say you're breeding a yearling, and if he doesn't have at least a 32 centimeter scrotal circumference, you're that's not good. And, you know, 34 to 36 would be better. Um, the thing about scrotal circumference is it indicates a lot of things, fertility being one. But another one that's real important is the generally those, and it's fairly, it's moderately heritable too. So the female offspring off of rams and bucks with a higher scrotal circumference generally are going to be early, earlier to reach puberty and more fertile than say a ram or buck with a, a compromised scrotal circumference. So very important, and it's really pretty easy to take and most people can do it themselves really with just a little bit of practice. And then the third part of the breeding sentence exam is the actual semen collection and then evaluation. And some producers can do this themselves, most can't. Um, and this is the part where you really need some, some professional assistance. For one, you need, a, you, know, you need the right size probe if you're doing electro ejaculation. Uh, which is one of the methods. Another method, and basically electro ejaculation is where you insert a probe into the rectum and you do pulsating elect electrical pulses that causes that ram or buck to extend their penis and then eventually to ejaculate. And then of course you collect the ejaculation uh, in a in a manner in a manner that uh, doesn't it doesn't uh, increase the odds of uh, of a semen compromise. The other method is, and really a better method if you can do it, because you generally get a, a higher quality semen sample, but it's kind of difficult for a lot of people, and that's to use an artificial vagina. Uh, you've got to have, well, you don't have to have males that are trained, but it certainly helps. And you don't have to have user does that are in heat available, but it really helps. And those oftentimes are kind of impede that technique, and therefore we generally just use electro ejaculation for the most part. Once that sample's taken, then it's evaluated for a number of factors. One, simply look at it and you can tell the volume, how many mils is it, what the color is. You generally want it in a nice white creamy color. Uh, any other color may indicate a problem, may or may not, but a nice white creamy color is desired. Uh, any contaminants, generally you're gonna look that under the microscope. And I'm talking about things like say white blood cells, red blood cells, things like that, not, not like leaves and stuff, okay. Uh, then you're going to look under the microscope at an, at an undiluted sample to just look at the motility or the movement of the sperm in that sample. And if you've ever looked at it, it's really striking, um, just like goes in waves. And especially in rams, they have a very dense amount of uh, sperm in a, in a semen collection. And that's one reason why they can breed so many ewes compared to other species. And then with a diluted sample, um, somebody that's trained in this can look at the morphology of the sperm and look for problems like, say, two ta you know, tail abnormalities, you know, 
cytoplasmic droplets, uh, head, abnorm head abnormalities. Now, some of this is normal in any sample, but if you get too high levels of abnormalities, then that male's, um, that male's ability to actually get that female pregnant is probably compromised. So very important to do a breeding sinus exam. And once it's completed, generally they're, they're, uh, they're classified. Excellent, just like it sounds. Probably just ready to roll. A satisfactory, most likely going to get things bred. <clears throat> the good ones to know from a breeding soundness exam are the last two. The questionable ones and certainly the unsatisfactory ones. Um, so if, that, if you have one that comes up questionable or unsatisfactory, you know, it's hard to say why it would be. It's a, every, every individual case is different. Um, but those animals can then be re-examined, say, four to six weeks later and see if, uh, if things have improved or if they've not improved. That's one reason why the timing of that is important. Because uh, if you, you know, you can do one of two things or really both of them, uh, you can re-examine them. You can also be making plans to get a different male so you don't have a disastrous um, breeding season if, if, that's, if they come up questionable or unsatisfactory. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but there are limitations of a breeding sinus exam. Um, it doesn't guarantee you that they're <clears throat> that they're going to actually go out there and actually have a lot of a libido and be aggressive breeders uh, and search out using heat or dozing heat and really get the job done. Uh, and really, there's a percentage of rams, especially that I know, that are uh, basically homosexual and they have no interest in the females. So if they pass the breeding sinus exam is excellent, you know, great physical shape, um, you know, the reproductive organs are, in, you know, perfect, really good semen sample. But if they don't want to breed use, then they still, you know, they're not going to get them settled. So, and there is a percentage of rams that are like that. Uh, the other thing about it is it's just a one day snapshot and that can be good or bad. So if let's say you do a breeding sinus exam on a male, say six weeks before breeding, passes it, well then a week later he gets all heated, uh, get, comes, down with the, comes down with a fever, you know, he can still be compromised in his breeding ability. So it's a one day snapshot. Uh, and what's really good is to do some close observation at breeding time. Just, just pay attention. Are they out there breeding? Are they aggressive? And if they're not aggressive, doesn't mean they're not, they're not effective. Um, but if the, you for sure wanna see them actually um, doing the breeding, if possible. Um, a breeding, a good old fashioned breeding harness is a good, um, <clears throat> it's a good insurance policy. Even if you do a breeding sinus exam, you know, a bre um, and this is an example of a breeding harness. Here it fits over there and then in between on the brisket area, there would be a crayon. Um, and you can change the color of that crayon every 14 to 16 days for rams and every, every 15 to 20 days for bucks. And let's say we use, okay, in this example, we use red here. <coughs> let's say the next cycle we put on a darker blue so it'll cover up the red. And if you've got 20 animals in this group and most of them have settled red, well then you know, that next cycle, almost all of them come up with a blue mark on them, and that's going to indicate to you, you probably have a ram fertility issue, because they're not all going to not breed. There'll be a few that remark, <clears throat> but if you have a real high percentage, uh, then you better start looking really closely at your ram or buck, because there's probably a problem there. Uh, and of course, then you can use these breeding dates um, then to calculate uh, when they're due to lamb or kid, which really can help in terms of management as you come into lambing and kidding season. <clears throat> so how many females can a ram or buck breed? That's a question I get commonly. If it's a mature, healthy ram, it's in good shape, has a good track record, he's passed his breeding sinus exam, um, 50 to 75 ewes is not out of line. Now, some people would argue with me about that, but they, they'll breed a ram to 200 ewes in New Zealand. Okay, now those rams have a big scrotal circumference and they're really, really good. But, you know, if, if a ram can't, and he's a mature, healthy ram, 
and he can't breed 50 ewes, he's probably not that good a ram. Okay, it's just it's just not that for he's just not that good breeding wise. Um, a mature, healthy buck that's passed a BSE 30 to 50 does. If they're young, say yearlings, common yearlings, or 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 um, you know bucklings or or ram lambs, um, you know half of those numbers or a little bit less than half of those numbers is probably good. And if they're an older and male, this just has some genetic good in them, but they're starting to get a little elderly and, and a little you know just don't get around as good. You know you want to take a little take a little care of them and give them a few less females to breed as well. All right, I want to talk a little bit about the ram and buck effect, which is kind of a neat effect. It's kind of an interesting thing, in my opinion. Um, and it's a known effect. And that's where when the ewes or the does are an anestrus, if they are completely isolated from the male for at least two weeks, and four weeks is better, and I mean completely isolated, they can't hear them, they can't see them, and they can't smell them. I don't mean isolated from one pen to the next or one pasture to the next, but I mean, like, they're on another farm, so to speak, you know, half a mile away, and they're completely isolated. <clears throat> and then once you introduce that ram or buck, uh, as you get closer to the breeding season, even during anestrus, those females will actually start ovulating, and they won't probably show an estrus, a heat cycle. It'll be more like a silent heat about two or three days after introducing the male and that's a ram or buck effect and I think it's pretty neat um, so that's one way you can try to if you're trying to get your user dose to cycle a little bit earlier uh, that's one technique that can be utilized and this can be a teaser ram or teaser buck too that you put in uh, they don't know that they don't know that they've been vasectomized uh, and the more aggressive they are the more of an effect you'll see from that ram or buck effect So we we'll use that to try to get them to come in, come out of that anestrus period a little earlier, to come into heat a little earlier, and then 14 to 18 days later, depending. Well, my yeah, about 14 to 18s later, 18 days later, a very high percentage of those using does will come into actual estrus, and actual heat. Okay, uh, of course the breed affects it, the libido of the ram or the buck affects it. Uh, and the real result is trying to bring them in earlier. And if you're an early kidder, an early lammer, and that's desirable for your operation, that's probably a technique you should be trying to, to uh, introduce into your operation. All right, I just want to say a couple of words about replacement ewe lambs and doelings. Um, I know some breeders like to breed, um, breed them at, say, 12 to 14 months of age. And I know some breeders do not like to for various reasons, and there certainly are advantage of breeding them. <clears throat> if you're, a, if you're a, you know, doing a good job in your breeding program, those younger animals should be your best genetics. So you want to get them into action as quick as possible. Uh, certainly, um, they'll generally produce at a high enough level to kind of pay for their developmental cost, which is good. Uh, and then there's been research studies that show that if they're bred, say, to lamb or kid at say 12 to 14 months of age, uh, they'll have a higher lifetime productivity, uh, even if you remove the productivity from that very first year. Probably has something to do with you know internal fat deposition, um, things like that. But but it's that's been well proven. Certainly, there's some disadvantages. You know they're they're more of a problem. They take, they have more dystocia problems. You got to you got to have a separate place to uh, feed them. There are more problems at lambing and kidding time. Uh, you know, you need a little more facilities, et cetera. So, you know, I know some producers don't and some producers do, and it's just kind of an individual choice, but you will have more productive operation. So a couple of things, if you do want to to uh, breed dolings or, or replacement ewe lambs to, to, uh, to lamb or kid at that younger age is don't run them with your mature ewes, okay? They need their separate own group. They just can't compete. They can't compete socially. <clears throat> they can't compete from a size standpoint. They can't compete from a maturity standpoint. Uh, I mean, their teeth aren't even in. Uh, and if there's a parasite problem or a health issue that goes through that group, they're going to be the first ones to get it. So really, they need their own group. They need their own group for the growing period. 
uh, because if you're going to breed them to kid or lamb at say 12 13 14 months old they need to be about 65 to 70 percent of their mature weight at the time of male introduction or very often they just won't cycle and then also they won't have time to catch up and develop so you'll have less dystocia problems when they get older so they need a separate growing period they need a separate breeding season or they just won't compete with the older females and for attention from the male uh, of course you want to if at all possible lamb and kid them separately lactation even you know just it's good management if you are going to breed them is to try to separate them and treat them and baby them just a little bit uh, you'll have a lot better a lot better success that way all right so just a quick summary um Give yourself plenty of time to do these practices before breeding season. That allows time to make changes. Um, you know, certainly evaluate use and dose for their health, soundness, breeding, and breeding soundness exam. I mean, body condition score, excuse me. Uh, use a flushing program, um, which generally includes, you know, in increased energy intake, but the mineral program is very important too. Uh, don't just use the ram or bucket breeding season and forget about him for the rest of the year. Uh, kind of take care of him, keep him in good shape, keep him healthy, keep a good nutrition and health program on him, uh, really year round. Uh, the next one, I hope all of you will do this, have a breeding sinus exam performed on your ram and bucks at least six weeks before we, uh, breeding, eight weeks would be better. Then of course, don't just turn them out there and think it's all going to be great because it probably will, but it may not. So just spend a little bit of time, and it doesn't take a lot of time, but just kind of observe. You know, are they breeding? Are they aggressive? Um, are they walking okay? Are they holding their condition together? You know, simple things like a breeding sound, a breeding harness can help. And then of course, lastly, manage ewe lambs and doe lynx as a separate unit. That's all I have. I hope that was helpful. If you have questions, fire away. Okay, we do have a few questions. Okay. So the first question is, if there's embryonic mortality before implantation, is there opportunity for another heat cycle? Okay, that's a good question. Um, all right, let's look at it this way. Let's say we've got 100, 100 use, for instance, in a group. <clears throat> and let's say on average they ovulated 2.1 eggs per ewe. Well, they not, they're not going to have 2.1 pregnancies, okay? So out of that group, you know, if you lose 40%, you know, you can subtract that off of, you know, the 2.1 per ewe. So you might get some ewes that would lose their complete pregnancy, but you might get some that might only lose one one embryo, okay, if that makes sense. So if they lose, um, you know, if they essentially come up open, yes, there is an opportunity to, um, to get them rebred once they recycle. <clears throat> the problem with that is, is that's when you get your lambing and kidding season strung out instead of, say, like, you know, two heat cycles, which is going to be 35 to 45 days, depending on what, what speaky, species, uh, you might get that strung out, you know, to 90 days, okay? So it's just always a good thing. Try to manage those animals to minimize e embryonic mortality. And now some's going to occur uh, naturally and normally. You just don't want it at a real high level. I hope that answered your question. I can't hear you, Sarah. Sorry, I muted myself. That's Next all right. Question. You know how good I am at this. <laughs> when can you introduce doelings to the mature does? What? Oh, do okay. Really? And I know this isn't possible for everybody. I understand that. Um, I mean, really, I would introduce them after weaning if, if I had the facilities for it. Now, most people don't. Um, if you don't have the facilities for it, then... And you've got plenty of bunk space, um, you know, possibly right before kidding. Although you got to be careful of the of the the damage the other older does will do to them in terms of 
you know, social fighting and social hierarchy structure. Um, certainly not during the growing period. Certainly not during the breeding period. Uh, certainly not during mid to early gestation because you're going to need to feed them pretty well so they continue to grow their body without their fetus is growing so large. Uh, so for certain not then. Uh, and then any time after that, depending on other factors. Uh, but ideally, it'd be after weaning. But I know that's not possible for a lot of people. I understand that. Okay, another question. Do you have minerals that you recommend for bucks to increase semen quality? Um, just a good quality mineral. Um, and there's a number of them out there. I'm, I'm not going to recommend a company or a product. Uh, there's some that are... There are some that are better than others. I will say that. Um, but if 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 their mineral status is adequate or normal or it meets the minimum requirement, then if they're genetically good, they should be fine. Uh, what what the problem becomes is if they don't get either adequate intake of mineral, or they're they're consuming a mineral that. Um, maybe say short on selenium, for instance, or maybe in, in terms of goats, maybe it's short on copper um, or manganese or zinc or iodine, whatever it might be. Um, so we should probably have a webinar on this sometime, how to evaluate your minerals, but um, you can do a lot to evaluate your minerals just by looking at the tag. And you want, you want those minerals to have the highest level of selenium that's allowed by law and that's going to depend on the intake. It's kind of, it can be kind of complicated. Um, but you can ask a lot of questions. And there are a lot of good quality minerals by various feed companies out there. Um, I know they're a little expensive. Um, but you can get a mineral without phosphorus in it. And that will cheapen up your mineral a good bit and still have all the other trace minerals, calcium, etc. in it. So just a good quality mineral. And then let, you know, let their genetic ability take over from there. Excuse one, me. one more question. Yes. If I, if I want to use cedars to cycle my ewes, but breed naturally with a, a ram instead of AI, what protocol should be used? Do you feel like okay. this is helpful to sync ewes for lambing in groups? Okay, that's a good question. I thought about including that in the talk, but then I thought it's going to just go too long. So um, there's, there's, well, cedars are a good they're a good tool. A lot of people have used them and used them very successfully. Um, there's some differences in protocols depending on the, the uh, operation and they really depend on the species as well. If you look on the, the packaging of the cedars, they recommend like five to six days inserted. Um, and I've seen some research that shows that that's adequate, but also I've seen research that shows that 10 to 12 days is better. So it's hard for me to say. Um, I'd say anywhere between that eight to twelve day period is going to be pretty effective. Um, now, if you don't want to, you know, if you're just trying to synchronize them, and you're not trying to bring them into heat, like say you would say if you're trying to breed in May or something, you may or may not want, you know, like PG six hundred. You may not need it if it's if they're coming out of that anestrous period normally. Uh, it just depends a lot on the season. Uh, and they're an effective way to, to uh, synchronize and to bring animals in. Now, the one thing I will caution, if you're using, if you're using cedars, whether it's out of season breeding or in season breeding, just to synchronize, they're all, all those females, all those ewes are gonna come into heat pretty much within a day or two, okay? So you have to have adequate ram power to get them settled. Um, if you've got 20 ewes you're synchronizing, you got one ram and they all come in the same day and a half, that's not adequate ram power. They can generally, essentially breed about five to six, and then we're talking natural breeding, about five to six ewes per day. And if they're expected to do a whole lot more than that, you're gonna have some issues. So number one, have adequate ram power and or stagger out the removal of the cedars, whatever is easier for you. And then it's so, so crucial that your rams go through a breeding sinus exam for that, just to double check and make sure um, that they're good and fertile and healthy uh, to breed that number of ewes in that short a period of time. Hope that answered your question. I think it did. Yeah. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Neary. That's our last question. Okay. So for those who are attending, I this you know, webinar was recorded and it will be posted to my YouTube channel tomorrow. And I'll send it to Phil on campus to post to the Small Ruminant YouTube channel. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Neary. And thank you, everyone who attended.